Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let's start with today's lecture. So, today we will be talking about uh, bioceramics. So, uh, we have primarily talked about uh, polymers till now because those are one of the most well studied class of materials for uh, tissue engineering applications, especially for scaffolds. So, we will be talking about bioceramics today. So, this is a large class of inorganic non metallic materials which is used in uh, repairing and replacing skeletal and hard tissues such as uh, hip joints, teeth, bone etcetera. They can have antimicrobial activity and they are resistant to pH change, uh, acid base solutions and high temperatures. Uh, they show better tissue responses than polymers and uh, metals. So, I must, I am talking about polymers which are synthetic and not present in your body. So, in case of uh, ceramics, there are many ceramics which actually interact well with your body and integrate very nicely. They do not release any compounds into the human body which will cause uh, foreign body responses. They are in general biocompatible to cells and can bind directly to bone. So, they fuse to bone to uh, form one entity. So, they can be uh, classified based on the source as natural and synthetic. So, uh, natural would be coral derived appetites and eggshell derived appetites which have been studied. So, coral derived appetites have been studied for a long time, they have they are even FDA approved for uh, using as bone substitutes. Uh, eggshell derived appetite is something which is uh, which people are interested in and uh, there has been uh, some momentum towards understanding whether these can be used for uh, bone tissue engineering and drug delivery applications. So, synthetic um, uh, ceramics include alumina, zirconia and other calcium phosphates uh, from different sources which have been used for uh, bone tissue engineering applications. Based on tissue response, you can classify ceramics as a bio inert or bioactive. So, bio inert is a uh, ceramic which does not interact with the body's environment apart from causing the initial formation of a fibrous tissue. So, this fibrous tissue will coat the ceramic and uh, further there is no other interaction. There is no aggressive foreign body response to these bio inert uh, materials. Uh, at the same time, they do not bond with the tissue, with the bone tissue. So, bioactive ceramics can actually bond between the host tissue and the implants. So, the example for bio inert uh, ceramics are alumina and zirconia. Bioactive ceramics interact with the body so that the tissue actually binds with the ceramic and there is uh, an eventual incorporation of the implant into the body itself over a period of time. Uh, ingrowth of bone can be achieved for these uh, bioactive ceramics. So, the examples would be bioactive glasses which are uh, non resorbable and you also have resorbable bioactive uh, ceramics like calcium phosphate such as tricalcium phosphate and hydroxy apatite. So, uh, coral based apatite is one of the uh, older uh, materials which was studied. So, these have interconnected pores with a skeleton which is similar to the corticular, uh, cortical and uh, spongy bones of your body. So, this has been used as a bone substitute and it was approved for uh, use as bone substitute by FDA in 1992 and people have tried to use this. This is primarily calcium carbonate that can be transformed into hydroxy apatite uh, using some chemical reactions. This shows a better bone resorption in its original state uh, on it if it is used as calcium carbonate it shows better uh, bone resorption. Yeah. Bone resorption means it will be uh, absorbed by your body. So, it uh, it gets replaced by the bone tissue, the actual bone tissue. Okay. But uh, the, what do you call it, the stitches which are there which also get uh, dissolved in the body are those resorbable? Resor resorbable, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, they are also called uh, resorbable sutures. So, what is like, how, how does that work? 
does it does, does the body kind of make a bone over it and then it will be dissolved like, like how because the stitches are fine stitches can just dissolve into the skin like the skin mm -hmm. is already formed over there and healed how will this work so this also happens the same way so this is just uh, like dissolving into the body right so it, it gets uh, absorbed by the body and uh, new bone gets deposited in the place so depending on uh, the rate of resorption and the rate of newborn formation you will have uh, replacement with the original tissue and so on so uh, this uh, coral based hydroxyapatite can be used as growth factor carriers and it has been shown to be osteoconductive and it shows excellent uh, bone bonding capacity so in the sense that it can actually bind with the bone and uh, form one entity so uh, there are okay some terminologies which you should know osteoconductive and osteoinductive osteoconductive is uh, when a new bone can bone ingrowth is allowed right so basically bones which are being formed can grow into the uh, scaffold which you are placing osteoinductive is something which can uh, trigger osteogenesis or new bone formation okay. so uh, osteoconductive materials are uh, bioactive bio inert materials are not osteoconductive they will just act as a barrier alumina is a bio inert material uh, it is actually a white powder uh, and it can be shaped and compressed and sintered to form a ceramic with which has very high density and strength it also has very good corrosion resistance uh, and biocompatibility it also has high water res uh, resistance it can be machined and polished because of this reason it is used in uh, the hip joints so if, if you remember some of the images i had shown of the hip joints when we talked about uh, introduction so you i have have shown some coating of ceramic on top in the ball uh, ball and socket joints so these are usually uh, uh, alumina and uh, these have also been studied for artificial bones and dental implants uh, and for uh, artificial auditory ossicles and for orthop orthopedic surgeries so uh, there are different uh, forms different structures of alumina the rhombohedral alpha alumina is the one which has been used for biomedical applications these are very stable and cannot be dissolved easily even in so, uh, strong acids and bases so uh, most uh, hip replacement joints are made of uh, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene and metal and uh, what happens is when you have these uh, uh, polymers polymer to metal contact there can be wear debris so this wear debris can lead to osteolysis which is the lysis of bone bone cells and uh, this can lead to loosening of prosthesis so people who were in uh, biomaterials class i would have talked about this so this is called aseptic uh, loosening and uh, this will lead to uh, the failure of the replacement itself of the implant itself so to avoid this people are trying to use ceramic on ceramic joints so where you have a ceramic coating on both the socket and the ball thereby you have lesser wear debris so alumina has very good wear resistance because of this people have tried to use alumina coating for uh, such applications so the advantage is it has very high uh, hardness and very low wear uh, rate it also has excellent biocompatibility it does not cause any inflammatory responses but the disadvantage is uh, it is brittle and uh, it can cause cracks because of this zirconia is another uh, ceramic which is also a white powder this can be compressed and uh, sintered to form a strong ceramic so the mechanical strength itself is better than alumina and its fracture toughness is also better however it does not have the same wear resistance as alumina so when you have uh, friction it is going to cause more of wear debris formed there are different variants uh, which have been used for zirconia implants uh, phase transition uh, can be done from metastable tetragonal grains to form a stable uh, monoclo uh, monoclinic phase this causes an increase in uh, volume uh, and a reduce uh, reduction in uh, compressive stress uh, which actually uh, hinders from the crack from continuing so this provides its uh, fracture toughness so when you have this uh, phase transition whatever crack is actually formed does not progress so only when the crack uh, crack progresses it's going to cause bigger failures so but uh, this also decreases the mechanical strength of the material 
So, people have tried to use partially stabilized zirconia where uh, yttria is uh, doped along with zircon zirconia and tried to use it as a uh, stable variant of this zirconia uh, ceramic. Presence of water can actually cause the phase transformation to happen uh, more rapidly. This affects its in vivo applications. So, because of this alumina has uh, been used more extensively compared to zirconia. Calcium sulphate is uh, one of the most well studied and one of the earlier uh, materials that was used. So, uh, the first successful use of calcium sulphate was uh, reported in 1892. So, it has been more than a century where people have been trying to use this. So, it is also called as gypsum or, or plaster of Paris. So, uh, this was approved by FDA in 1996. Uh, the advantages are it has a structural similarity to bone, it is also osteoconductive and it is very inexpensive and it is available in different forms either as hard pellets or as injectable fluids thereby you can actually inject it into the site where you need to form a particular shape or structure. Calcium sulphate also has a crystalline structure onto which the bone capillaries and perivascular uh, mesenchymal tissue, tissue can invade. So, this helps in uh, integration with the body. Uh, it, it can be resorbed rapidly within 1 to 3 months. Resorption causes pores that can help in bone growth, uh, bone ingrowth. The, uh, usually for bone ingrowth to happen you need to have pores and this uh, resorption can create these pores which can help in the bone ingrowth. However, this resorption rate is very fast. So, bone formation takes uh, up to 4 months and resorption of uh, calcium sulphate can start within a month or so. So, this means it cannot actually be used for uh, where you need new, new bone growth before uh, this can be re, uh, removed. So, uh, the ideal shape would be where both of these are balanced. Yeah, it has to be comparable. So, uh, you can have the resorption to be slower than new bone growth formation, uh, it would uh, provided it is not causing any uh, negative effects. So, then it would not be a problem, you can have something there and uh, it will still integrate well with your body. But if it is faster, then you have a problem. Okay. So, this is neither osteoinductive or osteogenic in the sense that it does not uh, trigger new bone formation, it only helps in bone ingrowth. So, uh, this can also cause redness and swelling at the site of implantation, which can cause discomfort and uh, which can also cause serious pain, which would lead to failure of implants. Bioactive glass is a material, is a ceramic which was developed in 1970s and uh, originally silicates uh, were coupled with other minerals which are present in your body like calcium, uh, sodium oxide and hydrogen and phosphorus. Uh, the original bioglass which is the 45S5 bioglass basically contains uh, 45 percent silica, 24.5 percent calcium oxide, 24.5 percent sodium oxide and 6 percent um, uh, uh, phosphorus pentoxide. So, this uh, bioglass has been bioactive and uh, it has been used for different applications. So, uh, when exposed to aqueous solution or body fluids, what happens is uh, the surface of this bioglass has the silica, calcium uh, oxide and phosphorus pentoxide rich gel layer which is formed and this gel layer is subsequently mineralized to form a hydroxy carbonate within a few hours of implantation. So, because of this it uh, cre pro promotes bone ingrowth. So, it is biocompatible and osteoconductive, it can offer a porous uh, structure which will promote uh, resorption and bone ingrowth and the porosity itself can be achieved with the way you fabricate the material. Okay. Uh, so, this does not induce any inflammatory response. And silica based bioglass bio is usually resorbed in about 6 months. Uh, phosphate and borate based uh, bioglasses have also been uh, developed and they are also being studied. So, borate based bioglasses are easy to manufacture and they show faster degradation. Uh, however, this degradation can be altered by changing the composition of the material itself. Phosphate based bioglasses have controllable solubility which makes them uh, desirable for your applications because you can actually tailor the way the material gets resorbed. So, they show a strong bond to the bone and uh, can withstand uh, uh, the 
stresses in the site of implantation. The disadvantage itself is uh, it is quite brittle, all these bioglasses are quite brittle and have very low mechanical strength and uh, decreased fracture resistance. So, this is a glass right, it is a type of glass, so it is going to be brittle. The problem with that is I, it does not mean you cannot use it, you would have you cannot use it in uh, load bearing applications or you would have to judiciously use it for specific applications and specific sites and you might have to fabricate it in a way that it would be suitable or use it along with other materials to provide uh, the desirable mechanical properties. Hydroxyapatite is the most commonly used uh, material today because uh, hydroxyapatites are part of the apatite family uh, which are crystalline with uh, a hexagonal lati lattice. So, they have a specific chemical formula which is Ca10 PO4 6 times OH twice ok. So, it is uh, calcium to phosphorus ratio is 1.67. So, that uh, that is characteristic of hydroxyapatite. So, hydroxyapatite is what is present in your body. So, you, the mineral which is present in your bone and teeth is hydroxyapatite. So, because of this uh, it is extremely biocompatible and does not promote it does not cause any inflammatory response. So, you can use it for bone and uh, teeth tissue engineering, dental tissue engineering without any uh, issues. So, you can have a natural hydroxyapatite or synthetic hydroxyapatite. The natural hydroxyapatite is porous uh, with various porosity depending on uh, the porosity depending on where it is being extracted from. So, if you are going to take uh, hydroxyapatite from trabecular bone, it is going to have about 65 percent porosity with pores uh, ranging from 100 to 200 micrometers in size. So, these pores helps in the osteoconductive property of hydroxyapatite. They have very slow resorption rate, so they are uh, going to be present in your body for a long period of time. They can actually be maintained in your body for up to 3 years and uh, this allows slow bone ingrowth and cell colonization. It uh, makes sure that your implant is going to be there uh, and because it is hydroxyapatite which is present in your body, it is going to integrate very nicely with your body as well, right. So, it is going to bind with the bone and uh, become a part of the new bone itself. It has very good mechanical properties uh, with compression stresses which are close to 160 mega Pascals. So, which is good, but it is not still not as good as your bone, right. Your bone compression stresses are usually in uh, 10 to 30 gigapascals. So, this uh, has very good properties. Synthetic and natural HA uh, have been used. So, to get better uh, properties what people try to do is use hydroxyapatite along with uh, tricalcium phosphate. So, uh, this mixture which is called as biphasic uh, calcium phosphate is uh, preferred to using general hydroxyapatite or tricalcium phosphate independently. People have also tried using hydroxyapatite collagen composites which is what your bones ECM is, right. So, your bones ECM primarily contains collagen and hydroxyapatite. So, this enhances osteoblast differentiation and promotes uh, osteogenesis, uh, new bone formation improves. So, uh, the ductile properties of collagen actually make sure it can act, uh, be prepared in the shapes and it provides the mechanical properties which are desirable for the bone itself. So, uh, you can actually prepare uh, these nano composites where hydroxyapatite nanoparticles are prepared and dispersed in collagen thereby you get uh, structures which are uh, very close to what your bone tissue would be. Calcium phosphate cements were uh, invented in 1986 uh, and uh, this was approved for non load bearing uh, bone defect treatment in 1996. These are a bioresorbable material which can stay in your body for about 2 years. So, these consists of a calcium phosphate powder uh, which is mixed with a liquid and uh, there is an isothermal reaction leading to the hardening of this in 15 minutes to about 80 minutes. So, this is what is used in your uh, dental uh, fillings and so on. So, uh, the result uh, this after the reaction it results in the formation of nanocrystalline hydroxyapatite. Uh, which makes the calcium phosphate cements osteoconductive. So, this can, the advantage of using these is it can actually be used to fill gaps and uh, cavities and uh, because it is 
uh, a paste, it will actually fill the, uh, it will take the shape of the cavity in which you have uh, used it. So, injectable uh, cements have also been used for vertebroplasty and uh, kyphoplasty which is basically uh, injuries to your spinal uh, bones okay, and your disc uh, problems. So, if you have a compression fracture of your spine, then these kinds of cements have been used so that it can be used for healing the fracture. So, uh, these are uh, brittle and the clinical outcome is uh, not better than that of methyl methacrylate. Because of this uh, people still sometimes prefer to use methyl methacrylate for PMMA kind of uh, alternatives instead of uh, cements. <coughs> Beta tricalcium phosphate is uh, the most commonly used bone substitute. It is uh, a pure hexagonal crystal structure with high biocompatibility and bioresorbability. The porosity regulates the osteoconductivity of this material and the resorption is actually slower uh, than other calcium phosphates. Uh, however, uh, it gets completely resorbed in about 13 to 20 weeks. This is um, faster than hydroxyapatite though. Reports suggest uh, that there, uh, they have ability to influence angiogenesis as well. So, bone is actually a very highly vascular tissue. So, it has a lot of blood vessels and uh, it is important to create uh, a bone substitute which would have these vascular networks. So, uh, beta tricalcium phosphate has indicated that it can influence how the bone, uh, how the angiogenesis happens. So, some of the commercial materials where which use beta tricalcium phosphate are orthografts and uh, osperian. So, these are used uh, for bone replacements and regeneration. The biphasic calcium phosphate is a combination of hydroxyapatite and beta tricalcium phosphate. As I said, it uh, is preferred to HA and uh, beta tricalcium phosphate being used independently. So, this has the advantages of both these materials. So, it is highly osteoconductive, biocompatible, uh, it is safe and non allergic. It also promotes bone formation, new bone formation. So, in the sense, it is osteoinductive. Uh, it enables a faster and higher bone ingrowth rate uh, compared to hydroxyapatite alone. It offers better mechanical properties than beta tricalcium phosphate alone. So, the strength is still lower than the uh, cortical bones compression strength. So, optimizing this to get desirable mechanical properties is always a challenge. So, we looked at different fabrication techniques for uh, scaffolds earlier. So, the techniques which we looked at were all primarily for polymers, right. So, uh, those are scaffolds which we can prepare from polymers or different types of polymers. So, similarly for uh, ceramics, there are different uh, techniques which can be employed and uh, we will just quickly go through some of the techniques. So, one of the most common techniques uh, is foaming method. So, as I said, um, Porosity is crucial for ceramics because that is what will uh, regulate osteoconductivity. So, bone ingrowth will happen when you have a porous structure. So, the techniques which we will be looking at uh, will have ability to create these porous structures. So, uh, foaming method is uh, capable of producing highly porous ceramics with pores which can range from 20 micrometers to up to 1 to 2 millimeters. So, what happens here is uh, you disperse a gas in the form of bubbles into a ceramic suspension or colloidal sol solutions and uh, this is done by incorporating an external gas by mechanical frothing or by injection of a stream of gas uh, along with this suspension or introduction of an aerosol propellant. You can also have uh, create evolution of gas in situ either through in situ polymerization or um, techniques like that. So, this suspension is then solidified and uh, eventually the gases are released, the foaming, uh, the foaming agent is released thereby creating porous structures. So, this is similar to uh, one of the techniques which we looked at uh, for polymers. So, where again you used uh, things like ammonium carbonate where carbon dioxide can come out creating the uh, pores. So, the disadvantage is uh, it is difficult to uh, achieve high pore interconnectivity and uh, also there is a non-porous external surface. So, the pores are present only in the inside. 
and it might not be present on the surface which can cause uh, problems. You need to have a porous surface for the bone and growth to be better and for cell infiltration to happen. Amongst these uh, foaming methods there are a few uh, different types. So, H2O2 foaming is one of the more commonly studied and a simpler technique to use. So, what is done here is uh, the ceramic powder is mixed with an aqueous solution of H2O2 where H2O2 is the foaming agent. So, the mixture is cast into molds and stored in an oven at 60 degrees Celsius. The uh, H2O2 hydrogen peroxide decomposes and oxygen uh, is released in the form of bubbles in the slurry uh, which causes the foaming process. And as, this fo uh, as these bubbles come out you create the pores and finally, the sample is sintered and uh, the percentage porosity and the pore size can be uh, modulated by using different concentrations of H2O2 and so on. The pores are interconnected only in the uh, in a laminar manner which results in poor interconnection uh, in the direction which is perpendicular to the lamina. So, it can only be connected in one direction. So, another technique which is used uh, which is an eco friendly technique is the starch consolidation technique. So, corn, rice or potato derived starch granules are used as pore formers and binders. So, uh, what is done is uh, the starch granules, ceramic powder and water are mixed to form a suspension and the suspension is continuously stirred and maintained at 60 to 80 degrees Celsius and finally, these uh, are cast where the starch starts swelling because starch can absorb a lot of water and forms a gel like material. Then it is thermally treated, so in the sense it is heated to burn out the organic phase and sinter the ceramic phase and because of the uh, starch granules which occupy the uh, cavities in between where the uh, ceramic is sintered, you will have pores, pores which are formed. However, the pores are not interconnected in this case because only the starch granules uh, occupy the pores and there is no way to create interconnected pores. So, sponge replica method is uh, the most common method which is used for commercial uh, materials. So, what you see here is are commercial bone grafts which are ma manufactured using sponge replica method. So, the technique itself was patented in 1963 and uh, this has been quite popular and very effective. So, what you do is uh, you basically impregnate an open cell porous template with a slurry of ceramic powder and a binding agent. So, you first create a template uh, the shape in which you want to create the scaffold and this, this is usually made out of uh, some natural or synthetic polymer and uh, you then load it along with the uh, ceramic slurry which is present along with it and the sponge is squeezed to remove any excess slurry and the, slurry, uh, the ceramic is used to coat the sponge uh, the struts and the uh, curves which are present are coated with the ceramic uh, as a thin layer and then this is dried and the coated template is uh, pyrolyzed to remove the sacrificial template. So, now you have only the ceramic which is remaining. So, you create a positive mold, so whatever mold you created you have the exact sh shape in a form of a ceramic. So, the ceramic coating is sintered at high temperature so that you get the porous ceramic with the same architecture and during centering the sacrificial template is lost. So, the most crucial step in this uh, sponge replica method is uh, to get uniform coating on the polymer st uh, polymeric structure because if you have ununiform coating then you are not going to have reproduce the same structure. So, the factors which influence this are the rheology of the material and how well this um, uh, suspension can adhere to the struts in the sacrificial template. The rheology is crucial because it needs to be the suspension needs to be sufficiently fluid for it to allow penetration. It needs to reach all the areas of the template so that it can coat it completely. At the same time it needs to be sufficiently viscous so that it does not just drain off after coating. So, after coating it needs to stick there and remain there. So, that will happen only if you have the right viscosity. So, uh, the limitation with this method is uh, you may not get desirable mechanical properties, uh, you would get something which is slightly weak. So, other than these techniques you also have the solid free form fabrication techniques. So, these are broadly called as the rapid prototyping techniques. So, these are moldless technologies where uh, people use uh, layer by layer deposition 
using uh, computer generated uh, 3D models. There are different strategies, uh, stereolithography, selective laser sintering, uh, sintering and uh, powder based uh, 3D printing are the most common ones which have been used and all of them seem to have their own advantages and disadvantages. So, uh, I am not going to go into details of the advantages and disadvantages, but you can go through these uh, review articles. I think I have already uploaded them, I am not sure, but if not I will upload them today. So, uh, these would you know, these review articles and uh, book chapters actually give you enough information about uh, ceramics and have given you an overview of what ceramics are. So, uh, with this we come to the end of uh, the different materials which are used as scaffolds. So, we will talk about cells, uh, the cell sources, cell types which can be used and also uh, tissue homeostasis regarding cell adhesion, migration proliferation and so on in the next few classes. Yeah. So, thank you.